Good morning and welcome to this week's webinar featuring the Paratech Highway Vehicle Stabilization Kit. Thanks for taking a little bit of time to join us this morning. Uh, my name is James Koloskowski. I'm going to uh, be your host for the next 30 to 35 minutes this morning as we go through the Highway Vehicle Stabilization Kit, uh, kind of bumper to bumper. Uh, just a little bit about us uh, before we get started. The company was founded in 1962. We're a, a second generation family owned and operated business. Uh, all of our products are, are made right here in the USA. Uh, we make whatever we can uh, in-house ourselves, right down to the fittings on our uh, airbags and shores. Uh, you know, our primary market is the uh, fire service, but we're also involved in both industrial uh, as well as military applications as well. Uh, if we take a look at uh, the support that you've got available to you out there in the field, you've got myself, obviously, uh, but we've also got uh, Robert O'Donnell on the East Coast. We've got Chris Framstead in the Southeast and South Central. Uh, we've got Mike Ulibarri in the West Coast uh, Territory and John Lyon in Northern Illinois. Uh, along with those guys, for anybody that uh, might be joining us from Canada this morning, uh, we've got Mike uh, Weiss and Alex Kay up there uh, to take care of you guys uh, north of the border. So as we go through this, uh, there's actually a question uh, and answer section there on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we'd like to get as many questions in here as we possibly can. Uh, but that chat feature on the right hand side of the screen is going to be your way to interact with us this morning. Uh, now, I will warn you that the folks on the other side of that interaction are uh, like myself. So words per minute may be more like, uh, I don't know, 10 to 12, not the uh, typical 50 to 60 that you might expect from your uh, 911 response team. But uh, bear with us. We'll get back to you. But yeah, the question and answer section there on the right hand side is your way to uh, interact with us as we go through uh, our presentation here this morning. So as we get into this, this is the fifth in the series of webinars that we put on here over the last uh, couple months with COVID kind of grounding all of us out here uh, from our traditional field travels. Um, we kind of turn to these webinars as a way to share just a little bit of additional information with you folks out there in the field. Uh, but it's our fifth in our, our series of webinars uh, already covered as the standard vehicle stabilization kit, the multi-force kit, uh, rapid extrication kit, and the hydrofusion kit. Obviously today is the highway vehicle stabilization kit. Uh, and here in a couple of weeks, we're going to be running out of content. So if anybody's got any questions or, or suggestions as far as what we might do next, uh, go ahead and toss it up in that chat section there on the right hand side of the screen and we'll look into maybe be able to provide that for you uh, sometime in the future. So as we go through this uh, again, uh, there are the future dates for you. Uh, Interstate Motorway uh, next week on uh, June 2nd, heavy vehicle extrication kit and the strut driver uh, is the final one we've got scheduled currently for 616. So, Again, moving forward, we'd like to keep this up, maybe not quite the same frequency as what we've been doing over the last month, uh, but certainly like to keep this up as we go along and, and move on uh, back into uh, maybe a little more standard operation as far as travel and, and being able to make it out and visit you folks out there in the field. Uh, just a heads up, just a little disclaimer here. This is a PowerPoint presentation only. Um, it's not a suitable substitute for uh, hands-on training at your department or with a uh, certified instructor. Uh, think safe, act safe, be safe, and remember, always lift an inch and support an inch. So as we go through this, we're going to take a look at the highway kit. We're going to break it down piece by piece here for you. Uh, now, there are 26 parts to the highway kit. And as we go through this, um, oftentimes there's a little bit of confusion as far as what's what. So just to make sure that we're on the same page regarding component names, if we take a look at this kit. It consists of four Acme Thread Rescue struts. So there's going to be two 25 to 36 inch shores and two 37 to 58 inch shores. It's going to consist of six extensions. So two 12 inch shores, two 24 inch uh, shore extensions rather, and two 36 inch shore extensions. Uh, just a reminder, extensions always go on the fixed end of the shore, so the non-moving end of the shore. And a reminder as far as your extensions on the gray shores themselves, maximum of two extensions or three feet, whichever comes first on the, again, fixed end of the gray shore. Um, included in the highway kit is also four 12 by 12 hinged base plates with anchor rings. Uh, pretty neat setup, lots of surface area with this base plate versus uh, some other options that are out there uh, available to you. So, you know, 12 by 12, it's 144 square inches, a lot of surface area to be able to support some of these higher loads we're going to talk about here in a little bit. We've also got four multi bases, four tie down keys, and four 27 foot ratchet belts to make up the complete highway vehicle stabilization kit like what you see in front of you today. All right, so capacity and links. We're going to spend just a little bit of time uh, talking about what all these capacities actually mean for you folks out there in the field. Uh, we really consider our highway kit 
uh, really kind of our standard to medium duty vehicle stabilization kit. So with this, using a four to one safety factor, we're able to support up to 80,000 pounds using this highway kit. Uh, we've already covered uh, that standard VSK in a previous webinar. Any of you that are interested in learning about that two short kit, feel free to refer back to that webinar. It'll be part of the links that we send out to you a little bit later today. Um, all those are available for viewing uh, here from the past. But the highway kit really is a great general purpose uh, kit, kind of a, a door opener to some of the other things that we can do. Uh, versus the standard kit though, we've got increased reach uh, for completed legs and our, our ranges actually that we can accommodate with these legs cover anywhere between 25 inches and 94 inches total uh, as far as shore length. Uh, you know, with this type of kit, we can do a traditional tension, uh, tension buttress uh, type setup. We can do a same side stabilization setup. Uh, the highway kit versus the standard though allows us to be in getting into some more complex angles. All right, we'll take a look at those here uh, in just a little bit. Uh, with this same kit though, we can support multiple vehicles. Our standard kit really is only a single vehicle type response capability. The highway kit, uh, again, begins to open that door up for being able to support some additional vehicles above and beyond what that standard kit does. Uh, we consider it an initial response, you know, kit for heavy rescue stabilization. Probably not gonna get the complete job done if you've got something particularly complex, but it's a great first line response uh, type setup for us to work with, all right? Included on all of the shores is gonna be a uh, load chart, all right? And this is a new load chart that's uh, begun shipping here recently. Uh, again, integrated to all of our shores now. On this load chart, you're gonna see both four to one and two to one safety factors. Now, I just wanna spend a minute because oftentimes when we start talking about safety factors, it causes a little bit of confusion to those departments that, uh, that I tend to visit. Um, just some things to keep in mind though, a 48 inch shore, so a, a gray shore run up to 48 inches is gonna have a 20,000 pound load capacity. And that could be a shorter shore with extensions. It could be a longer shore, just uh, extended a little bit, but it's gonna have a 20,000 pound load capacity with a four to one safety factor. The maximum length that we can reach with this kit is gonna be 94 inches. At 94 inches with a four to one safety factor, we're still gonna have about a 12,000 pound load capacity. So right about eight feet, 12,000 pounds still with a four to one safety factor. Now the question always becomes, what does a four to one safety factor actually mean? All right, well, four to one safety factor means that that shore uh, is gonna actually be able to support loads over 80,000 pounds at that four foot length. All right, so the workload is 20,000 pounds, but just to make sure we've got you covered, just in case anything goes wrong, we can actually support loads over that 80,000 pound mark. All right, so when do we wanna use a four to one safety factor? We're gonna use that four to one safety factor when the load to be supported is unknown uh, or when it's required for specific applic applications. Uh, some of those specific applications uh, would include structural collapse where four to one is always gonna be our default, all right? If we take a look at this, if we move to a two to one safety factor, what does that two to one do for us? Well, suddenly that shore that at a four to one, we can only hold 20,000 pounds is now rated to hold 40,000 pounds. The shore is not suddenly two times as strong. It just means that that safety factor now is just two times the workload, all right? So it's still gonna hold just over 80,000 pounds uh, before a strike failure, all right? Um, when we take a look at uh, when we might be able to get away with using a two to one safety factor, it's gonna be when the load to be supported is uh, you know, known or when we can es estimate it with relative uh, certainty. Uh, in other words, when we look at that load and we know that uh, you know, there's no way it can weigh over X uh, amount, uh, we can actually use that two to one load chart. So two to one, we actually will sometimes uh, revert back to uh, for vehicle stabilization, stabilization applications uh, two to one will sometimes also revert back to for trench. So because we can accurately calculate out the potential loads we might experience uh, in a trench collapse situation. Question also comes up, when do we not wanna be worried at all about those load capacities, all right? Uh, all too often I'll go out to the department, somebody will be uh, looking to stabilize a standard passenger vehicle. And the first thing they do is they start looking at those load capacities on the side of the shore. I can tell you for standard passenger vehicles, we really don't care uh, about those load charts, all right? Uh, rules of thumb with the shores, again, two extensions or three feet uh, on the fixed end of the shore, uh, but low charts really are not a factor when we're dealing with uh, passenger vehicles. Uh, just as a reminder, there's a, a nice chart that's been circulating here from, uh, I believe, RecMaster. Uh, it's been shared in the last couple presentations. We can send you a link to this as well uh, if you so choose to download it. Uh, it just covers uh, axle weights for traditional uh, passenger vehicles. And again, those traditional passenger vehicles, the axle weights we could be dealing with are well below anything that we would experience as far as the uh, load ratings for those shores. So tradition, traditional passenger vehicles were really never concerned about uh, the overall load rating 
that those struts can actually handle. All right. Um, so again, passenger vehicles, no problem. Uh, don't worry about looking at that load chart. Don't allow your uh, you know personnel to get all flapped up about you know what that two to one means or four to one means. Passenger vehicles, we really don't care. All right. When do we need to start thinking about what's actually on those load charts, though? Really, as soon as we start getting into heavier vehicles or unknown loads is when we need to really start considering the load chart and the safety factors as well. All right, so trucks, buses, heavy equipment, those kind of things are where uh, really truly we need to start looking at uh, what those load ratings actually mean here on these vehicles. All right, so we get into things like this and suddenly those axle weights you're going to see are you know, 10, 15 times more than what the standard passenger vehicle axle weights were. So dump trucks, buses, uh, over the road vehicles, uh, those kind of places. That's where, again, we really need to start considering uh, what those load ratings on the shores might be. Now, one word to note, just because an over the road truck might be 80,000 pounds, doesn't mean we're ever gonna support that entire 80,000 pounds on a single shore. So do keep that in mind. Uh, you know, if half that vehicle is resting on the ground and you're only trying to support half that vehicle's weight, uh, that can factor in your calculations as well. Uh, use your best judgment, add, add a little bit of fudge factor to that, um, you know, before we start considering those loads. So again, we're never going to balance an entire 80,000 pound uh, tractor trailer on a single shore, right? So as we move on, here's a couple examples of where we might actually uh, take a second look and double check your loads versus length. Uh, that garbage truck there on the left hand side was relatively heavy. I believe that was a, a project that Nigel was working on. Uh, we start looking at the extensions that are added to that gray shore. Uh, and the potential load of that truck, uh, that could be pretty close to what we actually uh, might experience on, on that type of setup. And then this uh, photo uh, of this military personnel or military uh, individual uh, down here on the bottom, trying to support the front end of that truck. I don't know what that truck was, but uh, clearly it's relatively heavy. So go ahead and stop and think about what you're doing. Again, uh, load versus length. That's when we wanna start looking at those load charts and considering the safety factors that uh, we're allowing our personnel to work with. All right. As we move on, I want to get into our rescue strut multiplier tables. Now, this has been covered a couple times uh, in the last few webinars, right? There have been a few things we want to keep in mind when we're setting out uh, shores for vehicle stabilization. Light vehicles, heavy vehicles, uh, really what we need to keep in mind is the axial load on the shore itself, as well as the tieback strength. All right. So traditionally with lighter vehicles, we're going to use a 45 to 60 degree setup as far as uh, the shore is concerned. Uh, for heavier vehicles, we're going to go ahead and make that just a little bit shallower, bring it up to 60 to 75 degrees for larger vehicles. Uh, it's all going to be about compression on the base plates and anchors. All right. Uh, just a reminder, ratchet straps traditionally have a rating, uh, working load rating of 3,300 pounds. Grade 8 chains are going to be 7,100 pounds. Grade 10 chains are going to be around uh, 8,800 pounds. Uh, and all those can be used in combination uh, or individually as tiebacks. Now, if you take a look here at 45 degrees, all right, our tie back is actually going to be experiencing a one to one load factor. The axial load at 45 degrees is going to be 1.41. Now, when I first saw these charts, I kind of wondered, you know, is this real? Is this something we need to need to, you know, really even concern ourselves with? Um, well, I can tell you, I showed up to a training up in Michigan here a couple of years ago. Um, uh, big thanks to uh, Carl Hine and Greg Pear for uh, allowing me to to share these photos here. But I showed up at a training up in Michigan here a couple of years ago, where instead of just taking those charts for granted, they decided, okay, we're gonna go ahead and measure that force, all right? So in this instance, the rear end of that truck was actually weighed at 5,000 pounds. A tension buttress system was set up at 45 degrees exactly, and it was placed on a near frictionless system. Now, when we talk about that being a near frictionless system, um, I'm gonna go back here, I'm gonna turn on my laser pointer. This load master scale here was actually set on cut off backboard, and then it was placed on top of rollers. All right, so we haven't gotten rid of friction completely, but that base is actually sitting on uh, a series of rollers here. All right, so near frictionless system is what we're working with. When we set it up, what our calculations tell us is that if we've got a measured vertical load of 5,000 pounds on the back of that truck, at 45 degrees, our estimated load factor is gonna be 1.4 times, all right? So if we've got 5,000 pounds on the back of the truck, we've got two shores set up, that's 2,500 pounds per shore is our expected load, all right? Our expected axial load on the shore itself is gonna be 3,500 pounds, and our expected strap load is gonna equal the vertical load on each shore. So the expected strap load is gonna be 2,500 pounds, 
the actual load on the shore is going to be 3,500 pounds if we just work with that chart that we've been showing you these last couple webinars. Well, again, they went ahead and they measured this. So we move on through this, that load master scale. This is the vertical force actually had a measured weight of 2,500 pounds per shore. Estimated load on the strut was going to be 3,500 pounds. Now, this is a load cell. I didn't get a great photo of it, but that load cell there is showing between three and 4,000 pounds. Um, and that load cell is not perfect. It's, a, it's a, a good rough estimate as far as loads. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and confirm the axial load as well. So again, that load shore or that load, uh, load cell was actually placed uh, right here at the base of the shore. So if you can see that laser pointer, that's where that load cell would have been right there. And it's measuring that actual 1.4 times the workload. So 2,500 pounds times 1.4 gives us right about that 3,500 pounds of force. All right. Uh, just as interesting to me, though, was what is our tieback uh, tie load? All right. And our chart tells us that at 45 degrees, if we're holding 2,500 pounds vertically, uh, we should be holding roughly 2,500 pounds as far as that horizontal tieback load as well. You can see on this load cell here, we've actually got 2,324 pounds. Um, so it's not perfect, but it's damn close to uh, being a true one-to-one -one type type load rating. So vertical 2,500 pounds, horizontal is also 2,500 pounds at 45 degrees. So what does this tell us? It tells us those load charts to me uh, are actually confirmed. So don't just tell me the chart. Don't just show me the pictures. Uh, show me what it actually does and what kind of loads we actually experience. So again, a big thanks to, to Start Rescue up in Michigan for allowing me to, uh, to share these photos here uh, today. But that load chart is available. If you've got any questions about that, uh, again, the chat section on the right hand side of the screen is a great place to ask questions. So feel free to reach out. Uh, your regional managers, some other paratech personnel are standing by uh, to do their best as far as answering questions. Any of you that have uh, direct questions for me, I'd be happy to, to chat with you after our call today. All right. So as we move ahead, some common applications that we cover with that paratech vehicle stabilization kit, so the highway vehicle stabilization kit, have really already been covered in our standard VSK and rapid extrication kit webinars. So the standard VSK and rapid extrication kit webinars are going to be available via the link that's sent to you later today, uh, again, by your regional manager. Uh, but just to kind of touch on those, uh, again, to remind everybody how those work. As we get into this, a traditional but, uh, tension buttress system, pardon me, uh, would be as what you see here. So you've got two opposed shores set up as closely, uh, close to directly across from each other as possible, and then tied back to the vehicle. Uh, that would be a traditional tension buttress system. Uh, be it Paratech Shores or somebody else, I, I would imagine anybody that's that's dealt with mechanical shoring out there is familiar with this type of setup. Uh, newer style setup, um, something that I've started seeing more and more of over the last couple of years is going to be a same side stabilization setup. And that's really where we place both shores on the dirty side of the vehicle and create a little bit of tension back against those shores. And that's what you can see here is that two shores on the dirty side of the vehicle, a little bit of tension back against those shores does just as good a job as that tension butcher style system. Now, what this does for you, if you can picture it, is uh, by, by putting those shores on the dirty side of the vehicle, we are leaving the top side completely clean and free of any sort of obstructions. So we stabilize on the bottom side of the vehicle. We leave the top side free. That's going to allow you to, uh, you know, completely affect your extrication with no obstructions whatsoever. So a really neat kind of setup. I would give this, give this a try out there in the field if you haven't had the opportunity to uh, Gives, give this a shot here in the past. Another common application would be stop the crush, and that's where a single shore is set up in a vertical manner um, near your stabilization shore, and all that's doing is stopping that vehicle from coming back down on what uh, might be trapped underneath it. So a traditional underride type situation, uh, you might set up a stop the crush shore. One thing you'll notice about that shore is it's not tied back to anything. It's not anchored to the ground. It really is just stopping the uh, vehicle from moving downward as you lift or, or move things further. Uh, chase and capture is something else that we can do with this highway kit. So in this case, we've actually used a multi-force airbag to lift the front end of this vehicle. And then we've come in with two shores. And as we lift using that uh, multi-force airbag, we are coming in and we are following that up with the shores. Uh, the old uh, lift an inch, capture an inch, or lift an inch, crib an inch, if you rather, uh, is exactly what we're doing here with that uh, highway stabilization kit. So lots of flexibility there uh, as far as how it's used. Uh, just one word to note about this slide. If we had some sort of obstruction near the top of those shores, now where the, when I talk about the top, um, I'm talking about the threaded end. Uh, so if we had some sort of obstruction towards the threaded end of that shore, there's nothing stopping you from flipping that shore opposite and putting the thread towards the base. There is no right side up or upside down with the Paratech Highway Stabilization Kit. 
as we go through this though, uh, when we go to deploy our highway kit, uh, you want to encourage your personnel to always do a 360, the object needing to be stabilized. We're going to pick our spot where stabilization struts need to be placed. Uh, we're always going to assemble the rescue struts away from the vehicle out of that hazard zone. We're going to pick the correct size strut and extension needed. Uh, pick the correct bases and heads for the job. Uh, we're going to place the anchor ring towards the vehicle to be stabilized and be sure that the lock pins are engaged in the holes and grooves on the shore and extensions. All right. We're going to adjust the shore to the estimated required length before approaching the load. Stabilize the vehicle, leaving enough adjustment inside the strut for uh, additional adjustment as needed. So if your load shifts, if you need to lift a little bit, we don't want to have that shore all the way stroked out right from the start. So leave just a little bit of adjustment there for yourself there uh, to work with. Uh, and then figure out what kind of anchor is needed. So referring back to those measurements that we did earlier, uh, we've got multiple options as far as ways to uh, anchor these bases to the ground. Uh, the most common are going to be ratchet straps, chains, and pickets. All right. Uh, if a single ratchet strap at 3,300 pounds is inadequate, there's nothing stopping us from uh, doubling up those ratchet straps and using two, um, et cetera. All right. So figure out what kind of tieback is going to be needed depending on the load that you're actually working with. Now, one of the things that's been asked, asked is, uh, do we have any suggestions as far as department training exercises? What I want to do here is I just want to briefly go through a, a pretty traditional in-service uh, department training that we would come out and provide for you. Uh, and we don't call it training. It's, it's really truly a familiarization of how our product works. Uh, but this is an exercise that you can do as an individual department uh, out there in the field. So we know hands-on experience is going to be a key. Uh, what you want to do is you want to go ahead and get two cars to work with. We're going to place one car on the side, one car on the roof, and that's how we're going to start our training exercise. For Evolution 1, we're going to, going to go ahead and split your crew into two teams. We're going to give each team the opportunity to stabilize uh, each car and talk about what they might do differently. Uh, for these setups, just a note, you probably only need two shores per, per car. Uh, there's no reason to deploy all four shores uh, on each car in most cases, so two shores per car should be adequate. It's going to allow your teams to work at the same time so that everybody's getting some good hands-on time uh, as they're going through this. And once you're done with that, you're going to go ahead and uh, stop and process again what works and what doesn't. All right, so what's going to work for you here uh, as we go through it? Okay. Evolution 2, we're going to leave those teams split into two different groups, and we're going to do a quick timed competition. All right, we're going to use the side resting vehicle for this competition. And we're going to start with the Highway VSK staged and ready, similar to what you see here on that tarp in front of Nigel. When the team is ready, start the timer. Each team will stabilize the car, and the timer will stop when they're done. All right, check each completed stabilization for movement, and our target time really is less than two minutes. Now, one of the things I'll mention to you about that two-minute time, and hang with me for just one moment here. All right, I apologize, but I had a message coming through asking me to get something off my face or something else here. But uh, each team is going to be timed, and our target time is going to be less than two minutes. All right, if we take a look at uh, take a look at that, I was pretty skeptical, but uh, at Tom Gavin's request, Tom Gavin's our, our North American sales manager. I started about five years ago, going ahead and doing a two minute drill with every department before I left. Now I don't leave your department until uh, your team can actually have that vehicle up and stabilized in under two minutes. OK, so I would encourage uh, each group that if they don't hit that two minute mark on the first uh, first try, they go ahead and give it one more shot uh, and try it again. All right. So again, target time less than two minutes. We're going to check each stabilization for any sort of errors. We want to try to avoid suspension components if possible. Uh, make sure the ratchet straps are locked all the way down, etc. So once we're done with evolution two, we're going to go ahead and move on to evolution three. We're going to reset both vehicles. Uh, in a manner, and, and this is kind of a crazy setup that uh, Nigel Leatherby shared with me, but uh, we're going to go ahead and set up both vehicles uh, in a somewhat unstable manner, maybe where both are involved, and both require some sort of stabilization. Uh, I would bring the crew back together and allow everybody to work together as a team. Once those vehicles are completely stabilized, we're going to go ahead and, uh, you know, if you want to go to the next level, go ahead and introduce additional uh, department extrication equipment to that, that training scenario. All right, so what else? If we take a look at our highway vehicle stabilization kit, this is actually the most popular kit that we sell. Uh, it's designed as a true multi-purpose system, and it's a great starting point for, you know, really expanding your department's uh, response capability. So for those of you out there that already have the highway kit, the question is, what else can we do? Uh, the most logical first step is going to be to go ahead and add some chain. 
So if you don't have chain already, and, and this chain is, is common tow chain, um, if you don't have chain already, go ahead and add some chain uh, to your department's uh, you know, capability. Uh, we do recommend a minimum of a grade 80. Um, grade 100 is preferred, uh, certainly for these applications, but by adding some chain to our existing highway stabilization kit, we can now go in and sling a load uh, or you know, capture um, odd objects, oddly shaped objects, like what you see in that pipe there with that green car, uh, very, very quickly and very efficiently using that chain. Once we have chain, if we want to be able to make the next step to heavier loads, we can go ahead and add our uh, big rig rescue head. Now, this big rig rescue head is designed as a multi-chain base. You can accept both 3 8 inch chain as well as half inch chain to the, uh, the head itself. Um, that half inch chain has significantly increased capacity versus the 3 8 so that can be added if you want to be able to add uh, that additional capability as well. Uh, what else can we do with the highway kit? Well, we can add lifting capability. Uh, our most popular lifting uh, option is actually our hydrofusion shore. That hydrofusion shore is what's shown there on the left. It was covered in our last webinar for anybody interested in uh, learning a little bit more, but that hydrofusion shore takes your highway kit and now not just being able to stabilize, we can now lift up to 10 tons uh, per shore. Uh, if that is not of interest to you, if you want something maybe a little bit more compact, we do also offer a strut driver option. That strut driver option is what's shown on that right hand side there. That strut driver option actually is good for 5,000 pounds. Uh, it's available in two different flavors. One is a fully integrated version. Uh, but if you're adding this to the highway kit, we actually offer a retrofit kit, uh, which is what's shown in the picture there on the left hand side, which consists of the gearbox that, that can be installed directly on top of uh, your existing highway kit shores. Uh, what else can we do? Well, we can add our uh, Paratech vehicle stabilization controller. By adding this VSK controller, uh, that actually allows us to put just a little bit of air pressure on those shores. Now, as we lift the load, as that load shifts, uh, we can keep our personnel back away from the load. Uh, the only time they would have to step up then would be to spin that collar down to lock it. Uh, this just puts a little bit of air pressure again on those shores so that that uh, shore is going to chase the load as it goes. All right, basically an automatic chasing type system, again, where you're only stepping up to spin that collar. What else can we do? Uh, congratulations, uh, you're, you're in a structural collapse now. I know uh, a lot of my departments out there say, now we never get into structural collapse. And I say, well, have you ever seen a car through the side of a building? Uh, that's exactly what we have here is a car through the side of a building. Uh, those shores that they've deployed there uh, in response to that are the exact same shores that you've already got in your highway stabilization kit. Uh, now we can use those 12 by 12, by 12 bases to uh, stabilize that building. Uh, if you want to add a little bit more flexibility, we can add six by six bases to that though. Uh, just gives you a little bit more more capability from that highway kit as far as where those shores are placed and, and how they're placed. So um, again, vehicle stabilization obviously is the focus of this highway kit, uh, but structural collapse is certainly something that we can do easily with the included bases that are already there uh, as part of your system or by adding the six by six bases on top of it. Uh, what else? Well, initial response for structural collapse itself. Again, just like the, the vehicle through the side of a building, you add a six by six base or a channel base and that allows you then to uh, do some initial response for uh, structural collapse. We get into other applications, um, you know, initial response for trench rescue. If we take a look at these shores that are actually in the hole right now, those are the same shores that you would find in your highway vehicle stabilization kit. All we'd have to do to place a, a panel like that is add the six by six bases and a strut control package. Uh, that's it. So again, we can build on that highway kit, um, not taking up a whole lot more space on your rig, uh, add a few more components and give you the capability to do some initial trench response capability. So move on from the trench response, what else can we do? Well, how about a tripod kit? Uh, it's the strongest tripod you'll find out there on the market. This is not just man rated, it's also equipment rated. Uh, it's available as you see here. We could also add just the tripod head if you wanted to. Uh, using those 12 to 12 bases that are already part of your highway kit, create an incredibly strong tripod. Again, without taking up a whole lot more space on your rig. Uh, what else can we do? Well, we can do elevator support. So if you've got an elevator car trapped between floors, we can use that same highway kit. Uh, actually to capture that load, uh, you know, capture that elevator car, you know, just as easily as what you see here. And again, those struts are the same struts that are already part of your highway stabilization kit. Uh, what else? If you want to get into elevators more, we can do a high point anchor for elevator rescue. Uh, we'd add the elevator uh, shaft rescue kit, and that's what you see here in this photo here. Uh, particularly useful for blind shaft elevators. Uh, this photo was actually taken uh, at the Notre Dame uh, football stadium where uh, they were having several elevator issues with a newly installed traction drive system. Uh, wasn't working out quite right. You can see that uh, instead of traditional cables, those are belts inside. Um, and as they were coming up, they were having cars stuck between floors. And, and this was the solution they added to be able to 
send somebody into that blind shaft if they needed to be able to uh, go and retrieve people during the middle of a football game. Uh, anyways, as we get into uh, the next series of slides here, this is going to be something that's already been covered in uh, previous sessions, and that is the strut cleaning and maintenance. Uh, remember, our rescue struts can be cleaned with soap and water. Uh, you can also use a power washer if you're in particularly nasty soil. So, you know, like here in Ohio, we've got quite a bit of clay. Uh, clay doesn't come off real easily, so I, I do uh, typically use my power washer to clean things up a little bit. I do avoid your labels though with that power washer because it will peel the labels right off uh, if you're not careful. Um, when you're inspecting your shores, they'll go ahead and check the uh, collar side of the shore itself. I'm going to turn my laser pointer back on here. We're going to check the collar side of the shore, and you're going to see right here that that O-ring actually fits right here on the shore. All right, that's nothing more than a bumper on that shore itself, all right? So that's a convenient inside I'm gonna keep this collar from actually binding up against the uh, top end of the thread, all right? So that's just a convenient inside item, but you wanna make sure that that's in place. If it's not there, you can just pop a new O-ring on there. Uh, that's good to go. On the piston end, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the cup seal itself, and that's what you see down here in this picture. Uh, we install the cup seal, it's gonna be a V. That V is gonna be pointed towards the base of the shore. So it's gonna be pointed this direction uh, so that the open section of the V itself uh, is pointed towards the base. We're going to double check that cup seal to make sure there are no gashes or cuts in it. Uh, we are going to lubricate that cup seal. Now, as far as lubricant, depending on where you live, it depends on what kind of lubricant you can use. Uh, in my area, I like to use a clear silicone lubricant. Uh, you can also use white lithium. White lithium is particularly helpful in hotter environments. Uh, you know, if you take this shore out, you lay it out in direct sun with clear silicone on it, clear silicone is going to melt off. Uh, fairly quickly in some some particularly hot areas. Um, but white lithium works well in hot areas for you there. Um, we want to double check that cup seal for any sort of cuts or gouges or anything like that. If there are any sort of cuts or gouges, go ahead and replace the cup seal uh, completely. No special tools are going to be needed here. Uh, it is helpful sometimes to have a little pick to be able to reach in there and grab that cup seal or, or pry that cup seal off the shore, but there are no special tools required for uh, for that job. Now, there were some questions last time about uh, this final statement here, which is do not lubricate Acme threads. Um, that is true. We do not ever want to use grease on the Acme threads. I will tell you that sometimes having a little bit of dry lubricant, so a spray dry lubricant is actually helpful to help those threads uh, move freely. So it is not required, but it is a nice, uh, nice thing to do, particularly when you're going into like trench situations and things like that, where you might not have direct access to be able to, to spin that collar. Uh, as far as the air inlet itself, very seldom do we see those air inlets damaged, but uh, if there is a, a chunk or a gouge in there, all you're going to need is an Allen wrench, and that entire uh, air inlet will unthread from the side of the shore. Uh, we want to make sure that that nipple is not loose and make sure that it's not blocked, which is actually the most common thing we'll see uh, sometimes after trench responses, uh, sometimes after trench trainings, you get a little chunk of uh, dirt or something else caught in that shore. Uh, if you have a blocked fitting, the way you're going to know is that that shore is not going to want to collapse. You're going to go to reassemble your shore, drop the threaded end back into um, the body. And if that shore doesn't push down, you probably have just a little piece of debris stuck in that nipple. If you need to get that out again, an Allen wrench into the nipple, it unthreads. You can clean that uh, very easily that way. We also want to double check our lock pins, though, on our collars and our extensions. Uh, when you double check those lock pins, make sure that they're tight. Uh, they have a tendency over time to kind of rattle free uh, occasionally, but make sure that those lock pins are tight. Uh, if you want to lubricate those, that's fine. You're going to lubricate those lock pins with just a little bit of WD-40 uh, to keep them from seizing up and keep them uh, free and clear and moving well. On the bases themselves, we're going to check that uh, anchor ring. Just make sure that those bolts are tight. Make sure that the cup is not loose. Uh, on the ratchet belt, we're going to inspect our ratchet belts to make sure that there are no frayed edges, uh, no cuts or anything like that. Uh, actually, on the ratchet belts, uh, you want to lubricate your gears on the ratchet belt, a little bit of dry lube, so the same stuff that we would use on the strut. Uh, we always want to check our hooks as well. You know, make sure there are no bends on that hook, on those hooks. Make sure there's no damage uh, visible on those little finger hooks that are used on the end of the uh, ratchet belts. All right. So this next slide is something I added after last uh, webinar. A uh, question always seems to come up: How do I store my shores? All right. Can I store them horizontally? Should I store them vertically, etc.? Uh, the honest truth is, we really don't care. Your shores can be stored vertically. Your stores shores can be stored uh, horizontally. Uh, there are no issues either way, um, so whatever works best for your rig, whatever works best for uh, your department, go ahead and store your shores uh, in that manner. All right, as we move on here, um, get a little preview of what's to come next. Again, we've got additional webinars coming up over the next couple of weeks. The more important thing right now, though, is what would you like to see from us? 
Uh, please give us some feedback in that Q&A section off the right hand side of your screen. You know, what would you like to see coming up? Uh, again, we've got just a couple more weeks uh, of webinars scheduled. The last webinar right now concludes on June 16th. And while we don't expect to keep up the same pace of weekly webinars, uh, you know, once travel restrictions have been lifted, uh, we are going to go ahead and continue these throughout the uh, foreseeable future. And again, some input from you would be helpful as far as what you'd like to learn more about and what you'd like to hear us uh, speak on during these sessions. Um, as we get into this, uh, just a little word of note here. Uh, we do have a, a grant partner. It's firegrantshelp.com. Uh, they provide you free grant research and application review. Uh, we're a sponsor of them. Um, it doesn't provide for them to, uh, you know, write your grant for you. It's not allowed, uh, but they will research uh, additional grant uh, opportunities that might be available. And they'll also take a look at your application once it's complete and give you any kind of tips uh, that might be helpful as far as uh, sending that application in. Uh, just a couple that uh, popped over up over the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, USC for California is coming due soon. Uh, Florida State Firefighter Education Foundation is coming due soon. Uh, Tennessee Homeland Security. Uh, Mississippi Highway Safety, and then Massachusetts Homeland Security Grant. Uh, all these are coming up over the next uh, couple months, I believe, from the email I saw from them here a few weeks back. So again, firegrantshelp.com, great resource for you to go out and you know, maybe find some additional funding uh, as we get into this. Um, this is a slide I left in here. I just kind of thought it was cool. Planes, trains, cars, trucks, military, industrial. Uh, again, the highway kit, multi-purpose kit, uh, not a whole lot you can throw at it that we can't figure out a way to work through. Uh, so that highway kit, again, great multi-purpose system, uh, planes, trains, cars, trucks, military, industrial. Uh, love that little line there. Uh, thanks, Chief O'Donnell. I think you were the one that put that in uh, into the last one. Anyways, um, this concludes our webinar. So just as a follow up, you're going to be receiving an email from your local regional manager. Uh, you can feel free to ask any questions back to them. We like to talk, especially right now where uh, you know our wings have been clipped a little bit. Uh, there's going to be a link to the feedback section uh, in that email. So feedback regarding uh, our webinars both today as well as past webinars we'd love to hear uh, what you thought of it and you know things that you uh you again might like to see different um it's gonna be a link to a short video covering the highway vehicle stabilization kit uh, we're going to provide you a link to the quotes section on our website and again a recording of this webinar uh, the past ones and a way to register for the future uh we hope you enjoyed it we hope you come back soon uh, come on back the next couple weeks join us as we uh as we work through the rest of our webinars that we've got on the schedule here and uh, everybody stay safe, stay well, uh, be good, and uh, thanks for taking time.